following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We are going to continue the course that we've been uh, following about practical spirituality. And this is the third lecture. This course has followed two of the core scriptures of Hinduism in order to help us understand what practical spirituality really is. And those scriptures are the Bhagavad Gita, which recounts a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. In other words, Christ and the human soul. And that scripture is an excerpt from a larger epic called the Mahabharata. And the second scripture we're studying is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And these are more recent, but are the root scripture of what people call yoga even though the description and definition of yoga nowadays is very far away from what yoga really is. And that's really the reason why we're giving this course, is to help those of us in the West understand that yoga is not simply stretching the body. That is like saying school is only what you learn in kindergarten. But we know that school is much more than kindergarten. Kindergarten is just the, the antechamber. And so the Hatha Yoga that most people call yoga is simply an antechamber. It has some benefits that it offers to those who practice it. But its spiritual benefits are very limited. And this course is taking us through the process of understanding how that is and why that is. So in this third lecture, we're going to talk about the senses. And as we mentioned previously, what we're concerned about in this course are facts. Facts that we can confirm through our experience. We really are not that interested in beliefs or theories or speculations, guesses. We only want to look at facts and work with facts. And for us who are here in physical bodies, we must use the senses. They are the gateway through which we acquire experience. And therefore, we need to know about them and how they work and how to use them and how they can deceive us. Because much of what we perceive that we think is fact actually is not. That discrimination is what defines a real yogi. A real yogi or yogini, someone who practices yoga, is not simply someone who's flexible physically, but someone who has conscious discrimination, who's able to discriminate between the true and the false. And that isn't just external, it's primarily internal. Recognizing what's true and false in oneself, in one's mind, heart, and body. So, to remind you, the first four lines of the Yoga Sutras say, now instruction in yoga, union, 
Union is the suppression of the modifications of mind stuff. Then the seer dwells in her own nature. Otherwise, she is of the same form as the modifications. So we talked about this in the first lecture, and we expanded it in the second lecture. And what this passage tells us is everything that the scripture is trying to communicate in more detail. But all of it is condensed in these first four lines. The whole message of yoga is here. You notice there's nothing here about stretching or about certain poses or postures. Nothing. Because yoga really has little, if nothing, to do with that. It has to do with the mind and modifications to the mind. Yoga is the suppression of modifications. Now, in the previous discussion, we talked about those modifications. They're called vrittis. And the essence of this message is that if we can learn to deal with modifications to our mind, we can then learn to experience our true nature. That true nature is what religions call God. Divinity, Atman, Brahma, Allah, Buddha, many names for this type of experience. So what this passage is emphasizing for us is that for us to have the experience of reality, what yoga really means, we have to work with our mind. The whole of yoga, real yoga, is psychological, not physical. The physical component of yoga, what people call hatha yoga, many other names that have been invented these days for types of yogas, those are only in their origin to prepare the body for the rigors of the psychological work. That's why people practiced hatha yoga in India a long time ago. That was the only reason. It wasn't to go and show off their bodies to others. They were actually living in recluse from society. They weren't interested in showing themselves to others. They were interested in training the body and preparing the body so that it would be a fit vessel for the rigors of the psychological work they needed to face in order to experience Brahma, the being, the reality. That's what this passage is pointing out to us. If we don't have that, that ability to work with those modifications that are influencing our mind from moment to moment, then we are of the same form as those modifications. And any of us can prove this. This, again, is why we've been emphasizing facts in our spiritual practice. When you feel angry, you become anger. Everything you see, hear, taste, touch, sense, think corresponds to that anger. You become that anger. The same with lust, the same with gluttony, the same with greed, the same with envy. When those qualities modify your psyche, you become that quality. And your vision is limited by the perspective of that quality and that quality alone until some other modification knocks that one out of the way. Most of us are unaware of how that works, but this is the state of the psyche these days. We are constantly passing moment to moment through modifications. And we call those modifications me, myself. I feel sad. I feel happy. I feel hungry. I feel tired. I feel rejected. I feel resentful. I feel jealous. Those so-called feelings are just modifications of the psyche. They're temporary. They're not real. But because we're not able to suppress those modifications, we don't know what our own nature is. And we think our nature is the modification that we're experiencing. You see, yoga is psychological. Real spiritual work is psychological. So those vrittis, the modifications, are like this whirlpool in this image. And that word vritti actually means that, literally. It means whirlpool. And this is a beautiful illustration of a psychological phenomena that we're always experiencing, but that we don't perceive. 
So in the previous lecture, we explained that the Yoga Sutras talk about five types of modifications. Some are painful, some aren't. And they are right knowledge, wrong knowledge, fantasy, sleep, and memory. And we explained those in detail in the previous lecture. I'm only pointing this out to remind you so that as we go deeper into the scripture, you'll have that context. Now, why a whirlpool? What does this image, this, this phenomena in nature communicate to us? Firstly, it is energetic. The whirlpool is a flow of energy that is modifying the water. Moreover, it is modifying everything that is carried by the water. And it's pulling anything it can down into the depths of that water. That is what avriti is in us psychologically. The water is our mind. That whirlpool is what's taking in the information that's entering our mind. And the depths are our subconsciousness. So what we perceive, what we think, what we feel, strikes the water of our mind and causes it to be in motion because we're not consciously controlling this process. So our mind is churning, circling, and we experience that. Notice how your mind is always circling, repeating, repeating, repeating. The same thoughts coming, the same worries coming, the same fears, the same anxieties, the same desires. Repeating thoughts, repeating feelings. That is the whirlpool of the mind. That is the modifications of the mind stuff itself. What is the state of your mind? In this image, we see two opposed qualities. I'm sure most of us have this image on the left on our desktop, on our computer, or on our iPad. We have a lovely picture of a beach somewhere that's very serene, and it makes us feel happy. Well, actually, what it makes us feel is envy, because we want to go there and just live there, right? We want to be in that environment all the time, not here in a dirty, stinky city. So we want this serene, beautiful, carefree state of mind, which is illustrated or represented by this beach scene. But when you really look at your mind, isn't it more like the one on the right? The stormy ocean? Isn't that normally what we generally experience? Storms of emotion? Storms of thoughts that we can't control? Someone says a word, we become angry. It disturbs us for days or weeks. Someone cuts us off on the highway or cuts in line in front of us when we're standing in line and frustrated and impatient and we get angry and that anger is the stormy water. Or we have a desire that is being frustrated, something we feel we want or we deserve and we don't have it. And that storm is raging in our mind, in our heart. This is why in the previous lectures we asked students to keep a spiritual diary and to start taking note of the facts of our experience. The actual events, things that actually happened, what we felt, what we did. To start making a record of not how we think we are, but how we observe that we actually are. And we asked you to have a specific question. Is this observable state my true self, my nature, my reality? Or is it something temporary and impermanent, something that comes and goes without my real ability to control it? And that type of inquiry leads us to realize that as much as we long for this serene beach scene to be in our heart and mind, we don't have it and we don't know how to get it. And we think that if we just make a little more money, have a little bit nicer place to live, have a little bit better 
friends or spouse or partner or family or job or whatever it is that we think we don't have, that if we have that, then our mind will look like that beach and we'll be so happy, then we can be really ser serious about being spiritual. We can be so nice to people and donate money and help people out spiritually. Once we have the things that we want, we think we'll have this. But this is all a delusion. You see, our experience, we make it. We have what's called manas. Most of the time we use that word manas and we imply with it mind. But when we look at the Sanskrit, the deeper meaning becomes very clear. It means a lot more than just mind. It also means heart. It also means imagination, intellect, inclination, will, temper, understanding, intention, spirit. There are many implications of this word manas. It says a lot. Now, unfortunately, most people who study yogic philosophy, Hindu philosophy, just read the English translations, and they just think manas simply means intellect, mind. And they don't grasp the real meaning of the word. When we observe the facts of ourselves, we see that we are much more than just an intellect. We have a physical body, and inhabiting that physical body is what we experience as a self, what we call a self. But that self is highly unreliable, mutable, changeable, and very influenced easily influenced by even very superficial things. I know we all think that we're strong people, resilient people, smart, and that we have the capacity to do well and survive in this world to some extent. But if we're really looking at the facts of who we are in the context of religious aspiration, we have to be honest. And we have to realize that what we think is self is actually a false construction. Something that we built and developed for our survival, for our protection. But that actually has no real meaning, no reality. When we study that in the context of looking at ourselves, we see that we have this physical body. And we see that inhabiting this body is this so-called self that has a certain name and certain memories and certain ideas and concepts and tastes, likes and dislikes. And all of that is always changing. The truth is that the real self, the reality of what we call self, never changes. All of us long for immortality. We're afraid of death. This is partly why we're attracted to spirituality. But the mistake we make is thinking that this self that has my name and my face and my language and my tastes and interests is what will become immortal. And this is not true. This self is the obstacle to immortality. It is the cause of my delusion, the cause of my suffering, not the redemption of it. This self is what causes the suffering. This is what we're calling manas in the first sense. It is mind-heart at our level. But manas is a lot deeper than that because there are levels and levels and levels and levels of manas, mind, heart, intelligence. There is a real self. In Hinduism, they call it Atman. And deeper than that, they call it Brahma. So to understand this more clearly, we always study the tree of life. We study Kabbalah. If we look at this structure of 10 spheres, it maps who we are on many levels. Our physical experience corresponds to this lowest sphere, which is called Malkut. The next one up is called Yasod. It corresponds to our experience of energy. And the next two up are Hod and Netzach. And these are what we can call heart and mind, emotion and intellect. Mind, heart, heart, mind. This is manas in the first level. But deeper, we have tiferet. 
which we can call the human soul. We can call it willpower. We can also call it manas. You see, manas can also mean will. So really, we're talking here about levels of manas. The lower ones are more concrete, more um, literal. And the more elevated ones are more subtle, more intuitive, more abstract. And going further, we see that we have what's called gebra, which we relate to consciousness, or in Sanskrit, buddhi. But it also is a type of manas. It is a type of mind, in other words, but even more subtle. Atman also, which is the next one, which in Kabbalah is called chesed, is the spirit, but spirit also can be manas. So manas in itself, I'm presenting it this way so that you understand that when you read the term manas or you hear the term manas, in most cases, what we're describing is tifret, human soul, but it embraces this whole region. They're all connected with each other. They're all interrelated, interdependent. You see, you cannot understand one sephira in isolation from the others. You can only understand it by comparing with others and understanding the others. It's the same with us. You can't understand your thinking unless you can understand your feeling. And you can't understand your feeling unless you also understand what's going on with the body. You have to study the whole. Not in isolation. Nothing can be understood in isolation. Things can only be understood in their interdependence with each other. So you see, this is quite a sophisticated but logical approach. Now, the important point here is that manas has three letters in Sanskrit. The first one is the letter M, which means water. For those who know Hebrew, this is exactly like Hebrew. The letter mem means water. Water is used as a symbol of mind throughout many religions, but especially in Hinduism. The mem, that M can also mean the moon or poison or time. The N letter can mean like or as. So right here we see like water. And the S, bestowing, granting. So the three letters of the word manas means bestowing like water, granting like water. What does water give us? Life. Not just physically, but esoterically as well. This is very deep significance, which we're going to come to. There are other meanings. That letter N can also mean war, fetter, jewel, pearl, gift. So you can translate manas to mean gift of from the waters, pearl from the waters. It can also mean poison. It can also mean war. And that letter S at the end can also mean a snake, a bird, air, wind, knowledge, meditation, a fence, a road, and all of those have deep esoteric meanings that apply, especially when you study mythology. So why explain all this? This seems very theoretical, but it isn't. We're talking about facts. So let's go back to the Yoga Sutras. The next lines that we need to study are 12 through 14. Now remember, we're talking about these vrittis, these modifications of mind stuff. So line 12 says, control of vrittis is done by abhyasa and vairaja. Of these, abhyasa is the effort to secure steadiness of vrittis. So we already talked about how we want that beautiful, serene beach scene or lake scene to be our quality of mind. We want to feel calm. We want to feel serene and at peace. This is universal. Who wants to feel pain? Who wants to feel in conflict? No one. Everyone wants to feel peaceful and happy and without threat. And that's what that symbol, that beach scene that we've all got on our computers, represents for us. It's a state of peacefulness and safety. No stress, no tension, no worry. We want that, but we don't have it. And we don't have it precisely because we don't know how to deal with vrittis. 
these modifications that impact our mind. This is the first thing that yoga teaches. Isn't that interesting? The whole world knows about yoga now, but nobody knows about this. But this is the very first thing the scripture teaches. That astonishes me. That everyone's out there learning how to do downward dog and sun salutations, but no one knows how to control their mind. And that's the first thing taught in the Yoga Sutra. How to control the modifications of your own mind. Step one of yoga is that. So the way this is done, the first is abhyasa, which means practice. We use this word practice in spirituality all the time. We talk about our spiritual practice. But let's become very cognizant of what that word means. In Sanskrit, abhyasa means practice, but it also means habit, drill, custom, study, use, military exercise, basically anything that's repeated, anything that's permanently and repeatedly being done regularly, consistently. Now we all think to ourselves, yeah, I, I do my 10 minutes of meditation. That's my practice. Or I do my one hour of meditation. Or I do my pranayama every day, or I do my yoga practice, whatever that spiritual practice happens to be. And we feel that is good, and that is our spiritual life, and that's great. But let me flip that coin for you and ask you about the other 23 hours of your day. What is your practice of those 23 hours in which you are not doing your meditation or your yoga? What are you doing? Because everything you do in every moment impacts your mind. If your mind is chaotic, if your heart is chaotic, it is because the modifications of your mind produce that state. Ten minutes of meditation can't do much against 23 hours, 50 minutes of chaos. It's logical. So this is why in ancient times, people who wanted inner spirituality extracted themselves from the regular lifestyle. They became renunciates, monks, nuns, yogis, sadhus, whatever the name you want to use, in order to lessen the impressions that they got from the outside world, to restrict the sensory data so that they could establish control of the mind and so they could practice that regularly. So abhyasa is that effort to secure steadiness. This is why people always left to go to the monasteries or go to the cave in the woods or up in the mountains. We don't have that luxury now. But we also don't need it. This can be done in your daily life. You just have to be aware of it. You have to make that your practice, your study, your abhyasa, to study your mind, to study your senses, and how impressions are creating your experience of life. Are you stressed? Are you tense? Are you wound up? Are you afraid? You made that. That state of mind was made by you, how you transformed what you perceived. You make your experience of life. That is a law of nature. No getting around it. That is the basis of Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, all of them. They all explain that. We are the product of our own works. So abhyasa becomes firmly grounded when practiced for a long time without any break and with perfect devotion. Most people read this and they think it means when you do your yoga stretches, you have to do it every day, you do it a lot, and little by little you get perfect at doing your, your asanas. It has application there, but that's not really what it's about. This is about steadiness of rithis, modifications of mind. Steadiness. Getting the psyche to become calm, to not be a storming ocean, to be a mirror, to be still, to be at peace. So practice in this sense means much more than just meditation practice or pranayama or repeating mantras. It means how we use each moment. How do we transform what we perceive? 
That is what Abhyasa is really implying. Now, the second part is vairagya. This means non-attachment. So the scripture then says, non-attachment is that particular state of mind that manifests in one who does not long for objects seen or heard, and in which one is conscious of having control or mastered longing for those objects. And the second line says, supreme non-attachment is that state wherein even the attachment to qualities is gone, owing to the knowledge of purusha. Vairagya means basically indifference. Now this term is partly how people got the impression, the idea, that to be serious in spirituality, you had to renounce all things and go live in the woods and eat a single grain of rice a day. And there are people who do that still. They think that's what this means, to be indifferent to worldly things. But these are mistaken concepts. This viraja is like the previous term, practice. It isn't literal, physically speaking, even though it has some meaning there. The real meaning is psychological. Viraja means to have a psychological indifference to fame or to being unknown, to having wealth or to having poverty, to having success or failure, to being skinny or fat, to being tall or short. One is indifferent. That's all it means. It's not complicated. It's a kind of attitude on the base level. And what that brings, when someone actually has that quality, they are no longer attracted to external objects. They no longer have the longing or desire to have things. They might have things but they don't care one way or the other if they do or they don't. So in a sense, it's somewhat like renunciation, but it isn't making a big statement and burning everything you own and going out into the woods in your underwear. That's not what it means. What it means is whatever you have or don't have, it isn't the point. It isn't the point of your existence. Now this is exactly opposite of our modern culture who is every day hammering into us that your life is only worth something if you have things, and especially the thing that they want you to buy. The car, the ring, the computer, the house, the whatever it is that is being sold. If you don't have that, you're a failure. You're worthless. This is what our modern culture tells us. If we aren't famous, if we aren't skinny, if we aren't pretty, if we aren't handsome, if we don't have the career or the education or the big house or the big bank account, then we are a waste of life. This is what our culture tells us. It's all lies. Our value is not in material things, external things. It isn't in appearances. It is in the quality of our heart and mind. And if you look into yourself, you know it's true. When you truly feel at peace, serene, and feel love for someone else, or feel loved, that is value. That is precious. Those things are what make up being a human being. Not objects. Not numbers in a bank account. That is what this is about. Vairagya in the first level is that. It's a state of mind that manifests in one who does not long for objects, whether seen or heard, and in which one is conscious of having control or mastered the longing for those objects. Now, objects doesn't mean just physical objects. It also means concepts, ideas, feelings. Anything that can be perceived, that is an object of perception. That's what object means here, not material things. Something that can be perceived and desired. The highest level of viraja is the supreme non-attachment. And this is a type of attitude that one has when one has knowledge of one's true nature. That's what purusha means here. And notice we call this the being. When you have experienced your being, really experienced that which is within you, you suddenly realize nothing that you ever wanted before was worth anything. 
Because in that knowledge of the being is perfect serenity. There's no need for more. But the mind is always about more. More of this and more of that. So practice and non-attachment. These are the two qualities that help us establish a serene mind. Practice meaning constantly, without failing, without stopping, always paying attention. That's what practice means, to be aware, to be watchful, to be cognizant of oneself. And in that, to not have attachment to anything that one perceives. So when we're getting praised, we don't become attached to that. When we're getting criticized, we don't become attached to that either. We respond to them exactly the same way. With kindness, with patience, but inside with indifference. Not caring if it's praise or blame. The one who's able to balance doesn't have attachment one way or the other. And thus maintains a steady mind. Steady heart. Why is this important? It doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Most students, when they hear about this sort of thing, they think, oh, it's sort of abstract, and I, I mean, I sort of get it, but I don't think it really means anything. And I just want to get onto the good stuff about having you know, extrasensory experiences and getting out of my body and all that. That's what I want to get to. I'm bored with the psychological stuff. But let me tell you something. These qualities are what prepare you to be able to have spiritual experiences. These are what prepare the mind. This is why this is the first thing taught in the Yoga Sutras. And it's the first thing taught in the Bhagavad Gita. We're going to get to that next. If you don't have this, you will become very attached. You will become a fanatic or a skeptic. So people go into their religion they don't have non-attachment or practice. So they don't really practice and they become very attached to things, wrong things. This is why people adopt a certain belief and they become very fanatic about it because they're very attached to it and they're very afraid to let go of it. This is why we have the violence we have in the world now. These people that are killing each other because of what they believe. That is attachment. That's why this has practical value. And it's the same about beliefs about yourself. You believe that you deserve the promotion and you didn't get it and you become angry and you start gossiping about the one who did get the promotion to hurt them. You create karma for yourself. You create pain for yourself and others. That is why this has value. It is that attachment to that perception of the promotion that you thought it was going to make you seem better or feel better. The suffering that's involved in that situation is a product of attachment. This next image is of the Buddha Shakyamuni. The Buddha Shakyamuni, who went through his process of development in India at the time when Hinduism was very widespread and, and there were a lot of contradictory teachings about the types of things that we're explaining today. He had experiences and saw that suffering was so awful that he thought he needed to find a way to fix it. So he went to the yogis and they said, you need to become a renunciate. You need to have non-attachment. And you need to practice. You need to go out into the forest and become an ascetic. Someone who has nothing. So he literally went to the woods with only his cloth and a bowl. And he ate a single grain of rice each day and only meditated. That's all he did. Meditate. That's it. That's how serious he was. If that doesn't put your own practice in perspective, I don't know what will. Now, in the course of that long time, he obviously became very weak and looked like a skeleton. That's why he's painted that way in this image. All of his bones could be seen through his skin because his body was wasting away. And in the process of his meditation, there are different stories that relate how this happened. But in synthesis, he comprehended that extreme asceticism was the wrong path. 
And on the other side of the pendulum from that was the path he grew up in, which was that of a wealthy prince, where he had everything. So that was extreme indulgence. So he was able to see these two extremes were both mistaken. Both were unable to solve the problem of suffering. And in the instant he realized that, there was a middle way. This woman shows up, whose name is Sujata. And she offers him a bowl of milk. Now that milk, the story says, rejuvenated him completely instantaneously. And he then went out to begin teaching his path of the middle way. Now I'm pointing this out because I know how our minds work and we hear about renunciation and we hear about non-attachment and practice and we get these extreme ideas that we have to give up everything we love and we have to lose all of our friends and family and become this sort of ascetic. It doesn't mean that. All it means is that we have to find that middle path between all experiences in all things, neither indulging nor always avoiding. But in the middle, what is the balance? Psychologically speaking, it is a type of non-attachment, not attached to avoiding or craving. Now, this story is very beautiful in how it relates to many mysteries in the teachings, but specifically to one of the core teachings of Hinduism, which is the story of how the gods and the devils churned the ocean of milk. Most people who know something about Hinduism have heard about this myth. It's called Samudra Mantan, which means ocean churning. And this story is related in several of the ancient scriptures of India. The basic uh, story is that the god Indra was offered a uh, ring of flowers as a blessing from a great sage. Indra is the father of the gods, the king of the gods, like Zeus or Jupiter, but in the Hindu mythology. And he always rides an elephant. Those who know symbolism know that in Asian philosophy, the elephant represents the mind. So Indra riding the elephant represents someone whose mind is under the direction of their inner being. This is an initiate, a master, someone who has development. That's what's shown in this image, for example, the Baba Chak, or the, uh, the stages of uh, meditative concentration. You see this elephant becoming more and more pure. And at the top, we see monks riding on those elephants. That represents a mind that is subdued. The vrittis, the modifications of the mind, are subdued. The mind is peaceful and calm, but very powerful, like an elephant. So Indra riding the elephant represents that. And this sage comes and, and offers him a blessing of flowers, and Indra puts it on his elephant. Now, the funny thing about the story is that the elephant is mischievous, and the elephant knows that Indra has a bit of pride. And we always hear that in the myths that Zeus and Jupiter and the different high gods always have this type of arrogance. And uh, so the elephant, as soon as the flowers are put on the elephant, he takes the flowers off and throws them on the ground to see what will happen. <laughs> so, of course, the sage who gave the gift becomes very angry. So who was proven to be the one with the, the defect <laughs> was the one who was trying to test the god. The sage becomes angry and curses Indra. As a result of that curse, all of the gods lost their power. Now, this myth represents how a master falls. Because of the mind, the elephant. And the gods inside of that master lost their power. See, it's a simple story. The result is that the gods want to get their power back. So on behalf of some of the other high gods, they realize that if they churn the ocean of milk, they can cause it to give forth the benefits that they need in order to regain their power and status. So they take a mountain, the mountain Mandara, 
which means mirror or heaven or tree of paradise. They also take the serpent from Shiva's neck and they wrap the serpent around the mountain and the demons who also want the power that will come out of this try to grab the tail and the gods prevent them. The gods grab the tail and the demons wind up grabbing the head of the serpent. And so they start churning the mountain in the waters. Now, it sounds like a kid story, but it isn't. This story has many levels of very deep meanings. Of significance here, that mountain is inside of us, not outside. And those waters are inside of us, not outside. This isn't some literal thing that happened. It's a story about how to recover oneself from failure, how to take oneself out of this powerless state and recover power and recover peace and overcome the demons, the forces that are in us. So this scene is exactly our mind when we take on the spiritual path. When we're really working in spirituality, we have a battle being waged within us between the virtues and vices, between those beneficent gods who are doing their best to help us and those devils who want to retain control over us. And what do they use to churn the waters of our heart and mind and body? The serpent. Now the serpent, we all know, is Lucifer. The tempting serpent of the Garden of Eden. That serpent is inside of us also. Most significantly, that serpent is the sexual power. And the waters are the sexual waters. Those waters are also the mind. If you study anatomy, you know that the brain and the spinal column are surrounded by liquid. And it moves up and down, constantly cycling from the top of the head to the bottom of the spine. That cerebrospinal fluid chemically is nearly identical to the seminal waters. In that fluid, there's a motion, a movement of energy and forces, not just physically, but psychologically. There's a very powerful relationship between the waters of the brain and the waters of sexuality. That's why genuine spiritual paths demand that one learn to control the sexual waters in order to control the mind. If you cannot control your sexual vrittis, you can never control your mind. It's impossible. But if you can control the, the energy that's in your sexuality, you can definitely conquer your mind. This is why all the beginners always became celibate in order to gain control of the sexual energy, to dominate that and begin to recirculate it using exercises that we're going to talk about in later lectures called pranayama and other types of practices, where that energy of the sexual water is cycled up through the spinal column to the brain and back, up and down, up and down. That runs contrary to this back and forth pull of the gods and devils. Does anybody see the shape of the energy that's being moved in this image. You see a cross. There's no accident there. There is a cross in this story. That cross has deep esoteric significance, which we talk about in almost every lecture. And that's the crossing of the polarities, the forces that are needed to really advance in this type of work. The basic point is, this is a psychological process, not a literal external process of gods and devils. These are the gods and devils in your own mind, churning your waters sexually and psychologically to tempt you, to test you, to see how you handle it. Now, fortunately for us in the myth, the gods win. I hope it's true for everyone here as well, that the gods will win the battle. And if they do, when the gods win and the ocean of milk becomes churned, out of that ocean emerge all kinds of beneficial qualities that rejuvenate the power of the gods. 
the most significant is a woman. Mohini emerges out of the waters. Mohini is an incarnation of Vishnu, but her name means delusion personified. It can also mean attractor or a bewildering element of some kind. Now, Mohini is a goddess. The result of this transmutation that's happening as all this energy is being moved in the waters. And she carries in her hand the Amrita, which you see in this image. This is the nectar of the gods. That word Amrita is where we get the word Ambrosia. If you know Greek mythology, then this is immediately obvious to you. The Ambrosia is what gives the gods their immortality. And that word Amrita literally means that, immortality. And this myth is nearly identical to the birth of Venus. The birth of Aphrodite, the goddess of love from the Greco-Roman traditions, who is born of the ocean's foam. She is Mohini. She is that goddess of such beauty that she beguiles everyone, men and women. The men, of course, are overwhelmed with attraction. The women are overwhelmed with envy. So this symbol is also inside of us. By working with the waters of our mind and the waters of sexuality, there is where we can find the potential for immortality. But the one who holds it is that woman. Now, she is a part of the divinity in us. She's an incarnation of Vishnu, which is part of the cosmic Christ. She is the tempting woman who holds in her hand like uh, Persephone, that jar that she's not supposed to look in, but it contains what is needed. So there are some esoteric myths that are all interconnected here. The basic point is this process, psychological process in us, Mohini represents all those things that we want all those desires that we have, all those dreams and longings that we've always had, that when we see them in our mind's eye, we become beguiled, bewildered, confused. This, of course, includes sexual fantasies, but it also includes being a successful person, being an attractive person. Whatever types of things we always wanted, we've always longed for, Mohini is that in other words, she is Lucifer. She is Mephistopheles, the one who appears in order to present the temptation, to test how we respond to it. If we conquer her, we get the nectar of immortality. So the story ends, the gods win, they get the nectar of immortality, and the demons go away disappointed. So we need that to happen in us, right? Here's how we do it. The Bhagavad Gita says, one whose mana is not shaken by adversity, who does not hanker after pleasures, and who is free from attachment, fear, and anger, is called a sage of steady prana. One who is everywhere without attachment, on meeting with anything good or bad, who neither rejoices nor hates, has consciousness steady. So this word prana has a very powerful importance in both Hinduism and Buddhism. In Hinduism specifically, it's related to consciousness. Awakened consciousness. This word can be translated in different ways. Sometimes it's translated simply as wisdom. But in English, that doesn't mean anything. So the real meaning is consciousness, but awake. That's why it says here, one who is everywhere without attachment, meeting with anything good or bad, who neither rejoices nor hates, has consciousness steady. It would say, has wisdom steady. That doesn't mean anything. But to have consciousness steady, that means something. So we need to understand what this means. 
This word prana is not just wisdom, you know, like being able to write down clever little wise phrases that you read in the internet and Facebook or something like that. That's not wisdom. That's cleverness. To be wise is to be able to discriminate what is true from what is false. That is wisdom. Your intellect does not help you with that. It cannot. Only consciousness can perceive reality. The intellect cannot. The intellect can only compare and contrast what it has already known. Let me give you an example. If you've grown up in a neighborhood where the police are viewed with suspicion and there have been numerous incidents where the police have been uh, questionable, have questionable behaviors, you grow up with that perspective of them in your personality, in your intellect. And thus, when you encounter a police officer, even being unaware of it, you will retain that attitude. Even if that police officer is trying to save your life, that attitude will still be there in your mind, in your interaction. And that's just the way the mind as mana functions because of the modifications. The one who is conscious, who's not under the influence of the modifications, will see things for what they are. So upon encountering a police officer, we'll know whether that is a good situation or a bad situation, whether that person can be trusted or not. They won't be influenced by past experience, but we'll see the reality for what it is. This is what we need to see things for what they are, not in comparison with our desires or our traumas, but to see them for what they are. This is how we change and become free of suffering, to see the reality and know how to respond to it. This is why this is so important, to be everywhere without attachment. That isn't external, it's psychological. That means to not be attached to how things are or how they will become, but instead to be content with oneself to be at peace inside, to have a calm, serene mind that is not being influenced by any subtle modification. So the next passage says, when, like the tortoise that withdraws its limbs on all sides, one withdraws the indria from sense objects, then consciousness becomes steady. This word indria in general use means the senses. So one withdraws the senses. But that term translated properly means belonging to or agreeable to Indra. Now you remember that that whole story of the churning of the ocean started because Indra was being tested. Indra is our own inner being, the ultimate of our ultimate, the root of our root, God inside. Everyone has that. Every one of us has that spark that light, that divine source. But we can't see it because our mind is so heavily modified. If we can calm all the modifications, that light becomes readily visible and we can experience what God really is and not just have theories or beliefs, but to know. That word prana means that. The J and A at the end, the nya, means to know. But it doesn't mean to know from knowledge. It means to know from perception. It's knowing through experience. And that pra at the beginning means before. So it's before knowing. How do you have something that is before knowing? You have consciousness. Consciousness is there before you have experience. This is a philosophical thing worth contemplating. We have that. And that consciousness that is there before knowing relates to Indra. And if our senses are under the control of our inner being, we have perfect peace. We're not in conflict with the will of God. 
we are performing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. That is what indria really should mean. It means to have our senses connected directly with our innermost. But they aren't. Look at the facts of your life. What are your senses connected to in you? Number one, desire. We are ruled from moment to moment by our desire for sensations. We want to touch and have certain feelings or sensations of touch. We want certain types of tastes, certain smells, certain sights, certain sounds. And the sixth is the sensory experience of the mind, imagination. I know that in the West, we talk about five senses, and that's because in the West, we don't have any idea what real psychology is. Yes, you can sense through touch, through taste, through smell, through sight, through your ears, but you can also sense through your mind, through imagination. And that is the most powerful one of all. Six senses. These six senses are constantly taking in data. That is the whirlpool. That is our mind. It's a whirlpool. It's sucking in information constantly through all these six senses. But unfortunately, we aren't aware of it at all. We're only aware of the sum of the sensations that we feel. And we're always labeling them good or bad. And we're always chasing the so-called good ones. Never recognizing how the sensations impact the mind. So you see all these senses flowing into the body through the three brains. Three brains. The most obvious one is the physical body, which has three parts. The instinctive aspect, the motor aspect, and the sexual aspect. This is where our nervous system functions in the body, taking in sensory data through all the senses all the time. And we're always chasing certain types of sensations. We want to feel good. In fact, we become addicted to feeling certain things. Never recognize the cost. We don't care about the cost. We only want what we want when we want it, and we don't care what it costs. We don't realize that that precise process of taking in all of what we desire is what is causing the state of mind that we have. We love our TV show. We love to hang out with that group of friends. We love to drink. We love to sleep around. We love to be uh, romanced or chaste. We love to be lusted after. We love to lust. We love sensations, but we never realize that sensations are just polar energies in nature. They correspond to a very strict, rigid law that never changes, and that is how energy moves in nature. It moves as a pendulum. Always, there's a law in physics called the law of invariance. What this law states is, if you remember an image of a pool of water and you see something drop into the water and it penetrates the water and the water descends a bit, right? Everybody knows this. You throw a stone in the water and you see it do that. But what happens right after? The water then shoots back up, doesn't it? And eventually back down and back up and back down and back up. That's what creates waves. Nature is balancing the forces in order to return itself back to that state of equilibrium. That is called the law of invariance. That does not only apply to physical things. That affects your mind. Your mind is water psychologically. When things impact the water, it creates waves up and down. And when enough of those happen, the whirlpool starts churning, churning, 
and you keep throwing more impressions and more impressions, more lust, more desire, more envy, churning the waters more and more. This is why our world is such a mess. Simply because of this. That's why this is the first thing taught in the Yoga Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. Number one spiritual lesson in Hinduism. None of the Hindus know it. At least they don't practice it. Because you see all the problems in Hinduism in India and all the places where Hinduism is prevalent could be cured if they only had this attitude of non-attachment and practice. If they only were able to withdraw this sensory power from their desires, then we wouldn't have these problems. So that word indriya means belonging to Indra, but it also means the power of virility, the power of the sexual energy, specifically semen, but sexual energy. This emphasizes that the power of the senses is most rooted in sexuality. And we know that. We know that the most powerful sensory experience that we can have is sexual. That's why everybody's so hypnotized by sexuality. So hypnotized and addicted to pursuing a brief and fleeting experience of sensations, which then go away, and then you're left with a lot of problems. People pursue a sexual fantasy. They find some person that seems to embody that sexual fantasy. They pursue that person to try to consummate that sexual fantasy. And when they experience those sensations, then the reality sets in that that person is a bad person, or they have diseases, or they get pregnant, or they turn out to be you know, a liar. All kinds of problems come out of these types of pursuits, and yet everyone is still addicted to it, not seeing the cost, not realizing that it's their own inability to understand sensations that's causing the problem. When you really comprehend what a sensation is, you can stop being addicted to it. What is a sensation? It is a brief, energetic event. That's all it is. Brief. Now, think about it. How many people can't lose weight? We know there's a lot because that's a huge industry worldwide now. All these promises and products and plans that will guarantee that you will lose all this weight in a short period of time. And yet, think about it. If all the people doing those plans were succeeding, we wouldn't need the plans anymore, would we? But it seems like every few years, those numbers of plans and ideas and concepts, there's only more of them, not fewer, which implies there are more people overweight than fewer. And it implies that none of those plans work. And you know why? No one can control that one inch at the tip of their tongue. That's all there is to it. That little tip of the tongue is what is controlling the body and the mind of that person. The desire to eat that food, whatever that person wants to eat, whatever sensations that person wants, they just want it. They don't care about the cost. They don't care about the result for their health, for their environment, for their pocketbook. They don't care. They just want to eat what they want to eat. And then later they say, oh, I can't lose weight. I'm so fat. I just want to eat one more bag of chips. Simple. But it isn't so simple, is it? Intellectually, not so complicated. But like I said, the intellect can't solve this problem. The consciousness can. When you comprehend the sensation is only a brief energetic exchange and it produces results, then you start to understand what's more important are the results 
of the sensation, not the experience of them, but what they create. So this is why in our practice, we have to study our senses and how they relate to the state of our mind. How does what we see and hear and taste and smell and touch change our state of mind? And why? What sensory experiences are we chasing after and what do they create in our lives? What are the results of those experiences? This is what we need to know. This is why the Gita says the objects of the senses fall away from the abstinent one, leaving the longing remaining within. But on seeing the supreme, the longing also falls away. The turbulent indriya, O Arjuna, do violently carry away the mana of the wise, while, even while striving to control them. Having restrained them all, one should be steadfast, intent on me. Consciousness is steady in one whose indriyas are under control. Okay. You want to learn to meditate? Do you want to learn to go into the astral plane consciously? You can. These are not difficult things to learn. But there is one prerequisite. Steady your consciousness. When your consciousness is steady, meditation is easy. So to get your consciousness steady, you need to put your indriyas under control. This means your senses and your sexual power. They need to be under control. Calm. Not controlling you, which is our current state. We are controlled by our senses now. We want to feel a certain way, so we put on music that makes us feel a certain way. We want to feel a certain way, so we go take a hot bath, or we go to the club, or we go with our friends, or we go eat a certain meal, or we... Whatever it is we do, we're always doing it because we want to feel something. But what we ignore are the costs, because they always cost us something, especially when we're indulging in pleasure, because that law of invariance is always there. You need to learn about that. The further you chase pleasure the more the pendulum will swing back towards pain. This is just how nature works. It's not an invention. It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's a fact. You can observe it. Observe those people who are sex addicts, who become addicted to that sexual experience, and you will discover that they have incredible amounts of pain in their lives. And they don't know why. They don't see that it's precisely the addiction that causes the pain. There is a pendulum in all movements of energy. One who's steady, who's in the middle, has experience of different kinds, doesn't become attached one way or the other, and gradually everything steadies. The mind starts to become calm. This is why we teach meditation the way that we do. People always come to these classes and courses. They say, why don't you have meditation in this way and that way, the way I learned it over here? And why don't you teach it like we, I've always learned it in other places? And it's precisely because the vast majority of the people that come off the street into the classroom have a completely out of control, wild mind because they don't control their senses. Therefore, they cannot meditate. Impossible. To really meditate, you first need serenity. And they say, well, I want to meditate so I can be serene. Yeah, that's true. But the serenity comes through your daily moment-to-moment -moment practice. Not through the 10 minutes a day or an hour a day. It comes through always cultivating serenity. Non-attachment. Not chasing desires all the time. But instead, restraining the senses, restraining the desires. Steadfast, intent on the innermost being. Instead of chasing desires outward or in the mind, we keep our attention focused on divinity. In synthesis, this is what we teach in, in uh, this tradition. Everything I explained here synthesizes three things. Self-observation, self-remembering, transformation of impressions. 
But if you want to learn more about what I've explained, study those topics. We have many lectures and books about them. If you don't have the ability to understand these practices through the facts of your daily life, you cannot meditate. It simply can't happen. It's just how nature works. It's how the mind works. You might think that you meditate, but you won't. Real meditation is where you extract the consciousness from the senses. And if the senses are agitated and addicted to sensations, you can't escape them. The addiction won't let you. You have to break the addiction, calm the mind. Meditation then happens spontaneously, easily. Now, we're on our third lecture, and I explained that uh, in this course, we were going to go through the steps of yoga. So in the first lecture, I explained the steps, the, the eight-limbed path, or Ashtanga yoga, which is taught by Patanjali. And so far, we've only talked about three. And that's because unless a student is capable of starting to understand what it means to be self-observant and to be watchful of the senses and start managing the energy of the senses, one cannot effectively practice anything else on this list. And as we explained, people always want to rush to the end and skip over the beginning stuff. And that's exactly why they never understand yoga. You cannot skip the steps. It's like trying to skip elementary school. You want to go straight into middle school, but you don't even speak English. It won't work. So to understand pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, all these later stages, you need serenity first. Now, a lot of instructors and a lot of students of yoga say, but you, you acquire serenity in these later stages, in pratyahara, dharana, and dhyana. And yes, that's true. You deepen it. This is true. What I'm explaining is simply what Patanjali and Krishna pointed out. That you cannot understand these higher aspects of yoga unless you're starting to bring your senses and sexual power under control. Unless you start having this ability to discriminate, to have serenity, non-attachment. So if that's what you want, we have repeat again what we did in the first two lectures. Learn these 10 steps of yama and niyama, five of each. We explained them previously. But now, work on these 10 in relation with your senses, in relation with the mind, Look in, studying how your mind is functioning. First step of yoga, number one, ahimsa, to be kind, to have compassion. Can you do that even when you're angry? Even when you're being blamed or attacked or criticized, wronged? Can you still be kind when you've been waiting for someone to give you something for hours and hours? Can you be kind and compassionate after missing a meal? Most of us lose our temper pretty quickly. What if you've missed two meals in a row? What about three? Most of the men are starting to get very cross looking faces. What if you suddenly were in a situation where you could not access food? And you had to go for several days without food. Could you still be kind? Patient. Now, I know we all think, of course I could. I can control myself. <laughs> yeah, you think. Every one of us has profound weaknesses when it comes to the senses. Eating is simply a sensory experience. We need to eat to live. 
But you will live if you miss a meal or a couple or a day or two. You'll still live. Yes, you'll be hungry. You might be cranky. But that's no excuse to tear people's heads off. But we do it. We miss a meal or we're an hour or two late to eat something and we become very cranky and angry. That shows we have no control over the senses or the mind. None. At least in that experience. That shows our weakness. We need to change that. What about truthfulness? Can you be truthful even if it means you will suffer consequences or someone you love will suffer consequences? Now, I know we all love to think we're truthful, but the reality is we lie when it's convenient and when we think we won't get caught all the time. We go to buy food or we go to buy something at the store and the checkout person doesn't check out one thing and they put it in the bag and we get outside and we look at the receipt and we realize, I didn't pay for that item. Uh, I paid enough to them already. I'll just keep it. That's not honest. It's a simple, silly example, but it is an example. What if that store depended on every little sale? What if they were on the verge of going out of business and you just helped put them out of business? We don't know the impact of our actions. What about to not steal? It's the same thing as that, taking that product we didn't pay for. But what about stealing someone's time or energy? We're very happy to steal people's time and energy to benefit ourselves. Brahmacharya is the biggest. We may think that we have sexual purity physically, but do we have it in our mind? Do we have it in our dreams? None of these are easy. Don't just read the list and think this is easy stuff. It isn't. The whole of yoga is the perfection of these 10 qualities. The whole of it. These should be the daily reflection that we have. This is why the spiritual diary we recommended was given as a practice. To reflect on these 10 constantly, every day, daily, looking at our behaviors, not just physically, but psychologically. And to understand where are we really, honestly. We don't have to tell anyone else, but at least be honest with yourself. So, to add to the practices that we've been giving you, this next stage is obvious. It's to observe the senses and impressions. And include that in the diary that we've recommended that you keep. Reflect on what you sensed, what you perceived, and how that's causing the state of your mind. Simple. Be honest and record only facts, and you will learn something. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.